I'd now like to ask Professor Simon Lachlan to uh, announce the citation for the second winner, winners for the Optoelectronics Prize. The rank prize for optoelectronics awarded to Thomas W. Cronin and Justin Marshall for their discovery of new visual mechanisms for the perception of colour and of circular polarisation. Vision depends on an eye's ability to extract information from incident light signals. For spatial information, eyes project an image to an array of photoreceptors. To allow colour vision, the array typically contains a small number of broadly tuned receptors with different spectral sensitivities. This mechanism, insufficient for detailed wavelength analysis, has dominated our understanding of vision for two centuries. In three papers published in 1988 and 1989 on the eye of the mantis shrimp, Marshall and Cronin described a new and radically different visual mechanism that is based on a scanning multi-channel optical analyzer adapted for detailed wavelength analysis. Their discovery was unprecedented. In a technical tour de force, they applied a definitive combination of exacting techniques to reveal the most complicated photoreceptor array in the animal kingdom. They found 14 types of photoreceptor, which provide 10 channels for wavelength analysis and four channels for polarization. Eight of the wavelength channels are narrowly tuned by a novel mechanism involving colored pigments arranged within waveguide structures. The photoreceptors are precisely aligned so that every point on a line across the retinophysial field is sampled by all channels. The shrimp moves its eye to scan this multi-channel analyzer across its field of vision, thereby obtaining exceptionally detailed information on wavelength and polarization at many locations. Marshall and Cronin followed up this research by describing additional photoreceptors in the ultraviolet spectral region, offering 14 narrowly tuned wavelength channels, and demonstrated that the shrimp scans it at its analyzer at speeds that serve to maximize the signal amplitude. Marshall and Cronin then spearheaded a larger effort to understand the function of the scanning multi-channel analyzer. This more extensive collaborative work led to three important discoveries. A new form of color vision that facilitates rapid recognition, a new visual modality utilizing circularly polarized light, and a new optical mechanism that is used to sense circular polarization. They have also worked with physicists and engineers to develop new devices and systems that take advantage of polarimetric and multi-channel spectral analysis. The discovery and analysis of complex, highly adapted visual mechanisms that support new forms of vision has both advanced our knowledge of vision and motivated researchers to explore a wider variety of animals and eye types by demonstrating that vision is richer and more versatile than previously thought. I'd now like Lord Darcy to come up and present the prizes to Tom. Please come Right, so I think my mic is alive. Uh, we want to thank the Rank Committee for honoring us today with the chance to, to receive this prize and also to talk about our work. Either of us could be up here. Justin and I had a discussion, and we decided it would be me who 
lost the toss and had to give the talk. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you a little bit about our work, uh, which took place over the last 30 years of research, sort of like Stephen just told us <clears throat> about. And it was on these very odd animals, the mantis shrimps. Uh, in a sense, uh, the mantis shrimps were predestined to win a rank prize eventually. Because you all will probably remember, if you're, at least if you're a member of the, of the empire, that Lord Rank himself always started his films with It will introduce itself in exactly the same way. Here is one. That's the first experience you will get if you pick up a mantis shrimp. It will smash you. Uh, and you will know you found a very special animal. So let me tell you a little bit about these animals. Uh, they're brightly colored, beautiful creatures. Although they're called shrimps, they're not shrimps. They're not related to shrimps very closely at all. They're 400 million years apart. You know, they're called mantises. They're not mantises either. There are animals that are unique in, in, in many ways. Of course, you can see their colors here. They have these hammers that we've already talked about that will smash things, including prey, predators, and you. Uh, and they have really unusual eyes. And you can see that in this video made by Mike Bach, who was a grad student with me who's present today. Uh, I think you can tell very quickly these eyes are not like anything else you've ever seen in an animal. They move independently. And the important thing for today, and that led us to this work, is they also can clean them up when they get dirty. Uh, they have three parts that you can see here. One that runs across the middle, it divides them into, into two halves. And then the remaining part is this thing we call the mid-band, which if you look carefully, and you'll see better in, in pictures to come, consists of six parallel rows of photoreceptors that have very special properties. Uh, we knew that these animals had three-part eyes, uh, for a long time, since, since the 1800s, the end of the work of Sigmund Exner. But we didn't know exactly how they worked. And I was looking at their visual pigments, and I wasn't getting very far. And then Justin, this cheeky graduate student who was working with Mike Land over here, started looking at their eyes from the inside. And he, by dissecting the eyes and looking inside of them, he showed that this mid-band, again, you can see the six rows here, one, two, three, four, five, six, had a group of very specialized photoreceptors. So here's a piece, a chunk of eye. Out here is the optics. All the yellow stuff is the stuff that focuses light into the photoreceptors. The receptors are down here. And the first thing he showed was that they have these colored filters that Simon mentioned earlier that are found inside the photoreceptors themselves. There'll be a unique arrangement not seen in any other animals, that the filters are inside the photoreceptive membrane. And he also showed that these these top four rows of the mid-band, remember there's six rows, are specialized for color vision. He didn't exactly know how, but he knew these color filters must contribute to it. And he also showed that by their structural features and in other, other ways, the bottom two rows, the last two, five and six, are involved in polarized light vision. I'm gonna pour myself a drink of water here, if you'll bear with me. So with this description published in, in Nature in 1988 that Simon mentioned, and with my work with using microspectrophotometry that I'll tell you about in a minute, we thought it was time to join forces and look at these animals. Now this picture shows a, a graduate student, Justin and me, and you can decide who is who in this picture. <laughs> but this is actually Chris King, who was a grad student also working on eye design and managed rooms at that time with me. And of course, this is Justin. I, I thought we probably would have a successful collaboration. When I picked Justin up at the airport, he didn't say a word until we got home, sat there quietly. I couldn't tell if he was shy or proud or just could, you know, was, was, was mute. But <laughs> I offered him a beer, and the first thing I heard was, I would kill for a beer. <laughs> and I figured we, had, we were going to have a, a good time working together. So what Justin had found that he could do was take these three-part eyes with the six-row mid-bands, section them using a, a frozen technique, so you get the retina out in fresh state with all of the living tissue still not alive, but functional as it would in life, and also showing the colors of the pigments inside the eye. So you, again, so you can see six rows here. One, two, three, four, five, six. The top four are the color rows, the bottom two, the polarization rows. You can also see some of the color filters in the eye. There's usually four types. You can see two of the four types in this particular section through the eye. And we could then take a, a preparation like this, 
put it in a microspectrophotometer, which is a machine that allows you to project a very tiny beam of light into a sample held in a microscope, and then measure how that sample interacts with the light. And you can put a beam in a single photoreceptor or a single filter and see how it works. So here's a picture of a microspectrophotometer in the lab today. Uh, this is the only optoelectronic device you're going to see all day, so please observe it carefully. <laughs> it does the job I just told you about. And when you have a section of the retina like this, you can place a tiny beam in each of these receptors and measure how it interacts with light projected through it. And so first we measured the filters. Here's what they look like in life and on, in frozen sections. You can see they're really beautifully colored pigments. They actually, the eyes are extremely beautiful when you prepare them this way. And we can measure their way that they absorb light. These are just sample spectra to show how these four filters of one particular species interact with light and absorb it. And we thought probably the color vision of these animals depended on a combination of filtering and then one single visual pigment found throughout the rest of the retina. All the other crustaceans that have been studied have but one type of visual pigment. The visual pigment is the, is the protein that controls the ability to absorb light and starts the process of vision. So we thought color vision is produced by these strange filters. So we proceeded to look at the visual pigments, and we found there wasn't only one pigment. There was actually nine different kinds of receptors, or rather 10 different kinds of receptors described by their absorption of light through the visual pigments. Two in each of the color rows, one, two, three, and four, another one in the polarization rows, and a tenth one in the rest of the eye. So the color vision system depended not only on these visual pigments, but also on these, these not only on the filters, but also on visual pigments. And as a result, we got what Simon described as a series of very narrow tuned spectral receptors, color receptors, that kind of march through the spectrum from short to long <coughs> wavelengths. And you can easily see with a system like this, you could measure color in many separate bands simultaneously. So here you have eight. Humans only have three color receptors, red sensitive, green sensitive, and blue sensitive. So you can imagine that the color world of the mantis shrimp is much broader than ours. And this first work we did together in a period of about four or five weeks in, in Baltimore <laughs> led to the, the cover on nature. And, and Justin and I at that point signed a contract. We were never going to stop working together. So we've been working on projects since, since then. That's 31 years now. Uh, since that time, uh, other people we were working with, like uh, Johannes Oberwinkler and Mike Bach in my lab, uh, discovered the UV ultraviolet sensitive system within the eye. This just shows you the eye in ultraviolet light to, that would emphasize its interaction with UV. There were another four color receptors and two other receptors working in the ultraviolet. So now we have a 12-channel color vision system. Four of those channels are in the ultraviolet. Furthermore, uh, Hannah Thun, who was working um, in Australia with, with Justin, and unfortunately, Hannah couldn't come today, so she's not with us today, showed that the color vision system of these animals is actually the worst color vision system we ever found. It, it performs much worse than honeybees or butterflies or people. So we expected it to perform way down here with very tiny differences between colors being discriminable. Humans are quite good at this job. Mantis shrimps are terrible. You need to have colors that are very different before they will actually behave as if they recognize them as different colors. We don't really understand this, uh, and it's something that we're still, we're still looking at the way in which the color vision system has evolved to actually analyze and use color. Besides that, Megan Porter working with us showed that there's not really one visual pigment in each of these receptors. Each of these names is a different visual pigment. Some receptors contain up to 10 different visual pigments in a single photoreceptor. And Megan's in the audience today. She can tell you more about this. I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> but in any case, this again is far more complicated than any other animal that had been studied up to this point. Uh, humans only have one visual pigment per, per, per receptor, always. So to have this kind of combination is really strange. So color vision in these animals is much more exotic and much stranger than we ever expected when we started working together. So I've talked about the, the color vision system in these animals. Let's now look at the, so this is what we've covered so far. Let's now look at the polarized light part. And I'll finish up by describing that very briefly. So first I have to tell you a little bit about polarized light. Most of us don't think about it very often because we don't really pay attention to it unless we're wearing polarized light sunglasses. But in fact, most animals see the polarization of light. So what is light's polarization? Well, there's two kinds. Linear polarization is when the electric vector of light, now you can think of light 
you may know, light acts as a wave. It has electric energy that goes up and down just like a wave does. So as that wave approaches you, it's going like this. And to you, it looks like it's vibrating up and down. And you can deconstruct that into horizontal and vertical components, uh, which if, and if they're working together, they produce a, a, an electric field that goes down at one point and up another, once for each wavelength. But if you were to pass that light through a thing called a quarter wave delay plate, it, it dissociates the timing of the horizontal and vertical components. So now you can see the vertical component actually emerges ahead of the horizontal components. Sorry, the other way around. The horizontal emerges before the vertical. So that the first thing to come through is the horizontal wave. A little later, the vertical comes through. Then again, the horizontal in the other direction, the vertical in the other direction. And eventually, you end up with this circular pattern of, of electric wave electric vector orientation. So if you look at this wave from the end, it wouldn't advance like this, it would advance like this towards you. And we call that circular polarization. Animals don't see that. At least they didn't until mantis shrimps came along. So the mantis shrimps, this, this is the two rows that are sensitive to polarized light. They have in their main part of their photoreceptor membranes that are arranged perpendicularly like these are here. That's perfect for analyzing linear polarization, and many other animals have this in their eyes. But besides this, overlying these, there's another receptor. It's sensitive to the ultraviolet, but its membranes are oriented up and down 45 degrees to the underlying green receptors. And these overlying receptors were, Horace Barlow originally recognized that these had the potential to interact with polarized light and to actually act in, in, in the same manner as a quarter wave phase plate. And in fact, they do. So this is the membrane organization in those overlying cells. They actually convert circular polarization, which animals can't see, into linear polarization, which they can. And so by doing this, they allow mantis shrimps to actually see and analyze circularly polarized light. And here you can see actually on a man, well, let me tell you a little bit more about this. So it, this, this delay, so this just shows you the change from linear, from circular to linear. This delay plate has, is almost flat in its function across the spectrum. It outperforms any artificial device that had been built to this time, and it inspired the development of new approaches to interacting with circularly polarized light. Manistrums also have circularly polarized markings on their bodies. So this thing here called the keel on the, on the tail end of a manistrum is much brighter on the right side of the body in right-hand circular polarization, and it's brighter on the left side of the body in left-hand circular polarization. We can't see that. We just see it as being colored. But a mantis shrimp can. It can not only recognize this as a mantis shrimp, it can also recognize which side of the mantis shrimp it's looking at by the circular polarization. So that, that led to another cover paper. This one was uh, written by Nick Roberts, who's here today, who, under, who worked out the optics of the quarter wave delay plate. Uh, but the actual biology was done primarily by Sonia Kleinlogel, uh, working with Justin, and uh, Short Chu, working in my lab, who did much of, the, much of the actual underlying biology. So what are we going to do next? We have this crazy system that does all these kinds of analyses. It has crappy color vision despite that. It can see light that we can't see and no other animal can see. What do we study? So first of all, we're looking at the nervous system of these animals. Everything green in this picture is in the eye stalk, and everything green is part of the nervous system that deals with, with uh, vision. These animals actually have more of the nervous system devoted to vision than they have to every other, object, every other thing they do. Their eyes are literally bigger than their brains. So we, are, we don't understand how these work, but we're working on how this does work. We have a number of talented graduate students and postdocs doing this, and a number of collaborators that are working with us around the world to try to solve the problem of how do animals like mantis shrimps analyze their visual systems. We're also looking at how they use their visual systems for navigating. So I have a graduate student, Ricky Patel, who's looking at navigation in the real world using color and polarized light signals in the actual external world. And we've worked with a group at the, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to design artificial imaging devices that are based on mantis shrimp eyes, but that use elect electronic components and filters. And you can see here we have a series of narrowly tuned spectral receptors, very much like those you saw in the mantis shrimp. What you can't see is that these are also overlaid with filters that create linearly and polarized light sensitivity in an attempt to duplicate the kind of visual world that the mantis shrimp has. 
So uh, with that, I want to thank the people who have worked with us. This is the members of our labs who've done the part. These are just the members who worked on, on polarization and, and color sensitivity. A number of collaborators around the world and mentors who trained us and encouraged us and kept us working together. The agencies that have funded us over time, the Air Force, National Science Foundation, the Australian Research Council, Lizard Island Research Station. And we probably want to thank the Air Force for being stalwart supporters over the last 12 years. Uh, several members of our, of our uh, program committees are here today to hear this talk. Uh, the Rank Foundation, of course, and particularly the Committee on Optoelectronics. And probably most of all, we would not have been successful without these two ladies who were home, tending the home fires, keeping us alive, making sure we could get away to the lab when we had to in the middle of the night to study some crazy animal, and really standing behind us all the way, even when it was much of a sacrifice to them. And of course, our kids who didn't get as much time with us as they might have if we hadn't spent so much time in the, in the field or in the lab. Ben and Hannah are Justin's kids, Ian and Elena are mine. And if you'll indulge me, I want to have a quick travel through time to look at these 30 years we've had together. So I already told you about the beginning in 1988. Uh, not long after we went to Australia for our first field trip together, we still look pretty young at this time. Look at this. Uh, the third adult here is Roy Caldwell, who is the human mantis shrimp, who really understands every aspect of mantis shrimp biology. And frankly, without Roy, none of this work would have succeeded. He really understood what animals we should focus on, where to get them, and how to interact with them. Uh, this is Roy's son, Michael, who I'd like to point out now is older than us and has kids of his own. So it's been a while we've been working together. <coughs> Michael's also a scientist, I should say. He, he works on frogs and their communication <laughs> in, in Panama. Uh, in 1995, we had the privilege of working underwater in an underwater habitat together where we were studying mantis shrimps. Uh, Justin presided over all of the activities as Marshal of the Bailey to keep us honest. And in addition to mantis shrimps, he worked on these unusual, very um, emotional fish called gray angelfish that Justin specialized in. Many years later, here's the team now. We can see we have gotten a little bit older, perhaps, in the intervening 15 years. This is, this is me and here's Justin. But people in this group all worked on color or polarized light vision. Many of these people are here. In fact, more than half the people in this photograph are here today, which we, we really take pleasure in their presence. Uh, in 2013, Justin and I and two other people joined together to write a book on visual ecology, which has been really a success. And it's been, it was a real pleasure to work with this team. Sanka was supposed to be here, but unfortunately became ill and was unable to attend. But Eric is here today. And then just finishing up, even when I couldn't make it to the field or Roy could make it, Justin made sure we were there in principle <laughs> and that we had adequate beer to drink. So thanks to all of you for being here. We thank our family and friends for making the effort to come out here. And in particular, we thank the Rank staff for all the work they've done to make this possible. And we thank the Rank Foundation for supporting us in this, with this honor. Professor Cronin, Professor Marshall, thank you very much for that, that great talk. I know you went with it there, but saw a lot of you in it. <laughs> uh, Lord Darcy, we'd be hugely grateful if you would um, give a few words on your insights on where, where research and policy and application might be going in the foreseeable. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, my Lord. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be doing this, and I'm very, very grateful. Uh, to the foundation uh, in handing over the prizes for some amazing science. Uh, absolutely brain blowing. So thank you very much for that. Let me first start acknowledging Lord Rank and the family for this uh, amazing day. Uh, this is a day in which we see a huge amount of disruption in science, uh, but Lord Rank himself was a great disruptor. Uh, I read something about his amazing contributions and didn't realize that in actual fact he bought one of the estates near uh, where I live uh, in Ivor Heath in Buckinghamshire. And that's really how he set up Pinewood 
and then the Denim film, film studios. Uh, and the reason I say he was a disruptor, he was firstly a great visionary, but he also very quickly recognized that trying to build the filming industry in this country, interesting time as we leave Europe, uh, one of the major obstacles he had was the monopoly of the Americans in the film industry. Uh, sorry to some of our colleagues who are visiting. Uh, and he came up with the most innovative business model innovation at the time. So he decided to buy all the middlemen and the distributors in this country who were really challenging, challenging all these films to the United States. And really uh, amazing vision and amazing courage to get on and do that at the time. We are honoring today uh, three scientific destructors, as I said, in areas of metabolic medicine and visual ecology. And congratulations again to the three of you uh, from me. Also congratulations to the fund trustees and the Rank family present today. You should be very, very proud of your work, but also very proud of selecting such a distinguished group uh, of winners uh, this evening. Let me first start with Steve O'Reilly. Uh, we do share many things in common, one of which we both studied and came from Ireland, although I don't look Irish actually. Uh, in those days, uh, when I first went to Ireland in the 1970s, there weren't many people who looked like me in Ireland. So, and my name was Ara, and there was a very Irish name called Dara and surname of Darcy, and there's a common Irish name called Darcy. So I was the Dara Darcy, the dark paddy. So uh, <laughs> that's why when I you ever see someone who's uh, with the Irish accent, we always warm up together. But uh, unlike me, he's been an outstanding, outstanding researcher in molecular and metabolic medicine. Uh, he really spent his life in Cambridge transforming, as we've heard earlier, our understanding of molecular and metabolic bases for both rare and common forms of obesity. Stuart earlier said I led the, London, led the London Commission in 2014, working for uh, our current Prime Minister, who looks slightly different in those days. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, as a mayor, was responsible for the, uh, well, at least the public uh, health agenda in, in London. And one of the areas we looked at was obesity. And believe it or not, one in five children in London is obese. In actual fact, we looked at London's children's population and we compared it to any of the big capital cities around the world, and we had some of the worst obesity crises in London. And that was back in 2014. <coughs> and the predictions in this country in terms of policy in the next two decades, uh, we're going to uh, have doubling of the prevalence of obesity, irrespective of the bath that you use. So, uh, so there is a huge amount here, and I'm very grateful for Steve and his amazing team and, uh, and the wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation he gave. Also, remarkable work by Justin Marshall and Professor Thomas Cronin on their work on visual ecology. It's a real amazing science platform. It's a great example of science platform of what we call convergent science, of really bringing in scientists from all disciplines to work on a specific area. Uh, in my area of minimally invasive surgery, optics and imaging is one of the critical bits of what we do, and uh, including robotic surgery, and I think that's a, an area that I potentially see in the future a tremendous uh, amount of, uh, of translation. So, to finish off, I just wanted to say that, congratulate you again and say the work you've demonstrated today will inspire many of the new generation of scientists here. And I really want to reiterate the convergent science or a convergent science side of sciences. Both prizes uh, are examples of superb application of science, engineering, and technology. All of you are absolutely extraordinarily worthy of this prize and the high relevance to policymakers. So on that note, thank you again and wish you the best and thank you again for the opportunity to be here, uh, to share your knowledge and, uh, and uh, to hand off your prizes, the prizes to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'll make sure I don't fall into the Dara trap. But, Lord Darcy, thank you very, very much for those words. There will now be some photographs in here with the prize winners. Uh, I would be very grateful if you could slip back through to the plat room where there is a reception that we'll carry on with for a little while after this to celebrate these great prizes. Thank you all very much for joining us, and we'll see you in a second.